let's concentrate on daily getting the basics right. And that's what this episode and episode number 36 is going to give you. Welcome to the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. Join your host, Mark Slight, as he gets the best information, inspiration, help, and advice from the world's best athletes, performance coaches, and health experts so that you can look, move, and feel your best at 40 and beyond. Remember, it's never too late to live the life of your dreams. Now here's your host, Mark Slight. Hello and welcome back to the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. You are here now on episode number 35. And before I get into introducing today's amazing and beautiful guest, I just want to say a massive, massive thank you again to everybody, not only who downloaded and listened to the last episode, which really blew me away. The amount of downloads in the first hour alone really shocked me. You guys were waiting a long time for that episode. But especially for the people that reached out personally to me and sent me messages of support, the amount of people who said how brave it was and how inspiring that last episode was, really, really touched me because as you'll know, if you listen to the last episode, it was a real tough one to record. I kind of didn't want to do it for a long while. I was I was sort of um, shoehorned into doing it a little bit by my coach, but uh, I'm really, really glad I did it because it's, it's clearly resonated with so many people. It's made such a difference to a lot of people, even over the last few days since it's been released. And I'm really, really grateful for that. And thank you to everybody who's reached out and contacted me after listening to that episode. So here we are, back in the room today with episode number 35, and I'm so pleased to welcome onto the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast, Pollyanna Hale from the Fit Mum Formula. I just said this is episode 35. Really, for what we're going to talk about today, I should have had Pollyanna on episode one or two, because she's going to help me strip nutrition and weight loss and exercise right back down to its very foundations, so that everyone who's listening, no matter what stage you're at, you could really take away some great advice today, some hints and tips to just get you moving in the right direction, just to get you living a healthier life. Even if in the past you may have been up to like Olympic level nutrition, but you've just got a bit lost over the previous years, you know, work commitments have got a bit much. Maybe you've had a couple of kids and they're taking up a lot of your time and you're struggling with daycare and you're trying to juggle about five or six different things any any one given moment. Listening to Pollyanna today, she's going to give you some great hints and tips that just are so, so simple. You're going to wonder how you didn't think of them before. We're going to talk about, over the next couple of episodes, great, nutritious, tasty meals that you can do in minutes. Okay, minutes. And it's so, so easy to do. Great exercise tips as well. And one thing I've rarely talked about on the podcast so far is calories. That very basic ingredient to your weight loss journey the energy ingoings and outgoings, what are you eating, how much are you eating, and how, sh- how much should you be eating. It's so, so basic, but it's so, so important if you're trying to lose weight. We're going to get right down to the basics of that and find out exactly what a calorie is, what a macronutrient is, how many of them you should be eating, and the differences between carbs, fats, proteins, why you shouldn't be scared of carbs, the different forms that carbs come in. We're going to get into everything. Real basic level here, guys. So if you are struggling or if you're just on the very start of your journey, maybe even if you're listening to these podcasts and you don't know where to begin, I'm telling you now, this episode here, number 35, this is the place to begin. This is where you're going to get all your basic advice from. And I say basic, but we all need to keep revisiting the basics because we can start there and we can go so far along a journey and we get ourselves so lost sometimes, so confused. We read all these magazines and these these articles on social media and on websites and we just get ourselves too confused. Let's concentrate on daily getting the basics right. And that's what this episode and episode number 36 is going to give you. So I don't want to talk about it too much now. I want to bring Pollyanna in straight away. We're going to get straight into this. You're just going to get 20 minutes of great information that you can take away today, as always on the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast, that you could use to start living a healthier life. And don't forget to stay on after I've talked to Pollyanna because I want to just explain one thing that one of my friends reached out to me about after the last episode, and I think it's really, really going to hit home with so many people. It's something that I'd not really thought of before, but it's been pointed out to me this weekend, and I can't wait to share that with you. So stay behind for that one. But right now, let's get straight into it. This is episode number 35 with the amazing Pollyanna Hale.
Hello, Pollyanna. Welcome to the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Looking forward to it. Pleasure. We are going to talk a lot about diets um, today. Uh, We're going to cover every aspect of diet. What I'd like to say, or what I'd like to ask you first of all, what do you think is the perfect diet? And is there a perfect diet? Everyone's going to hate this answer, but the perfect diet is the diet that works for you. <laughs> so if, we, if you're asking me, is there a perfect textbook diet, as in one meal plan or one diet type we could give to everybody? No, that's not going to work for a variety of reasons. Um, number one is we're all physiologically different. We've all got different genetics. We've got different muscle types we've got different um we've, yeah we're all different biologically uh, we've got different lifestyles some people have an unlimited budget for food some people are on a very tight budget some people have loads of time to cook and shop and prepare food some people barely have time to do more than open a packet of crisps um sometimes we're cooking for ourselves and we can eat whatever exactly we want other people have to cook for a family and are to take into consideration what everyone else we eat as well. So there's no way one diet is going to fit all of those criteria for everyone because we are just different. But there are some similarities between pretty much every single diet type out there that we can pull together and everyone should be implementing. So yeah, that's, that's that answers that one. <laughs> Why, why do you think then that so many generic diet plans exist and, and they're so popular as well? You know, people, the Weight Watchers, the Slimming World, like, you know, your body coach diet. It's a very basic, take this away, do this, you're going to be fit and healthy. Why do you think that works? Well, not, not the saying that the diet works, but why do you think that sort of approach works for these businesses so well? Why do they sell so many of these plans? I think it comes down to human psychology. Humans like to have uh, a concrete answer. They, we don't like the unknown. We don't like uh, we don't like dead like dead ends. We like to know um, exactly what's happening, what we've got to do. We like very clear cut answers, and that's what these plans do provide. They're very very clear cut. Like eat this, don't eat that. This amount of this this amount of that, Um, these are the rules, these are the guidelines, stick to them and it'll work. And because it's so concrete, um, it kind of satisfies that human need for certainty. And certainty is one of those human needs that are very high up. And and we we don't like not knowing things, not knowing the answers to things. And they really do fulfill that need. So I think when people, and also people are tired and they're busy and they're short on time and they don't have the knowledge that you and I have as professionals. So they don't, and they don't have the inclination to go and learn it either. They're not going to go and suddenly study for a degree in it as a dietitian. So they just want the quick answer. Just tell me what to eat and I'll do it. Um, unfortunately, I wish it was that simple. I really, really do. Um, but it's not. But as I said, there are some things that are pretty simple that everyone can take away. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get to them in a minute. But why do you think things like Weight Watchers, Slimming World and these generic plans, why do they work? And in a lot of cases, they work really well for the short time, say the 12-week program or, or whilst you're in a Weight Watchers, Slimming World program, they work well. Why do you think it then goes pear-shaped when they come out? You've just touched on knowledge. I'm guessing that's one of the reasons why. Well, certainly with some diet plans, there is very little emphasis on nutritional knowledge and people are essentially given a food list or a plan to follow and they don't get taught why they're following it, why it might work, why it might not work. All they're doing is following an instruction manual. So without that instruction manual, they don't know what to eat. They'll go and do, say, Weight Watch or Slimming Well for, I don't know, three months. If they follow their plan properly, if they stick to their points allowance, they should technically lose weight because counting points and sins is, is sort of a, a way of counting calories. It's not an exact, but it's, it's basically around food restriction, calorie restriction. So they should lose weight. But without those guidelines, they come off it and they stop counting points or sins. They haven't learned anything. So they still don't know how to eat well. So inevitably, they're quite possibly going to go back to their old ways of eating that made them really overweight and unhealthy in the first place. And I think education has to be a key part of any 
kind of dietary approach, whatever that might be, I'm really keen on making sure that my mums understand why they're doing things. Because I know from my personality point of view, I'm a bit stubborn. And if I don't understand why I've got to do something and the logic's behind it, I'm pretty reluctant to do it and just put my faith in something. I, I'm really curious. I want to know how it's working, why it's working. Then when I can see logically why it's working, then I can do it. And not only that, am I more motivated to do it? And I think if, if and also once you've got that knowledge, you don't need a plan so much because when you're in a situation where you don't have so much control of your food, maybe you're on holiday, going out to restaurants, maybe you're and doing long days commuting and you're basically eating out of cafes and coffee shops if you've got the right knowledge you can still eat really really well even I mean even places like McDonald's do salads these days you know you could you can eat pretty well anywhere if you know how but you, you know if you don't have that knowledge then that's just not going to happen yeah, spot on. I think with Weight Watchers, if you're just living off the, because you can get a lot of processed foods from Weight Watchers and they've got the points and the calories all worked out. You take that away, exactly like you say, you go to a cafe, you don't know what to eat. It's really, really difficult. So how do you approach it with your clients? Because you touched on calories there. Slimming World and Weight Watchers are a big bugbear of mine because you can eat 2000 calories. You could eat 10 slices of cake a day, or you could eat 20 really good wholesome meals a day and you know which is going to be better for you so how do you educate your clients so that they can they can cope when they're not with you you've got to keep it really really simple i think a big problem that most people do is think it's a lot more complicated than it has to be um they think they have to be excellent in the kitchen they think they have to be making elaborate full-on recipes every single day they have to be following cookbook plans um they have to be buying expensive foods and an organic this and superfood that um and they really try and overcomplicate things so i try and take it right back to basics and the most important thing when it comes to weight loss or weight gain or weight maintenance even is calories so the first thing we have to do is make sure that calories in check but ironically, unless somebody is dead set on using things like MyFitnessPal to track their food or they just want to count up the calories in their food throughout the day, I'm actually not keen on going to calories directly because although calories matter, there are more than one ways, as you say, to hit your calorie allowance. You can eat an amount of food or an amount of calories that makes you lose weight by eating cake or Mars bars, that is very, very possible. So just going for calories directly isn't necessarily going to help because if you're eating calorie-dense, unhealthy foods like that, you're not going to have energy, you're going to be hungry because that's not an enormous amount of volume of food. Um, if you're eating high-sugar foods, just purely high-sugar, high-carb foods, you're going to get this energy roller coaster. you're going to get cravings, you're not going to be sleeping well. So I try and tackle it by implementing food strategies that mean that calories get reduced automatically without too much thought and without too much effort. Namely, two things, protein and vegetables. Now, that doesn't mean everyone has to live off chicken breasts and steamed broccoli, but I do want everybody eating half a plate of vegetables or salad with each of their main meals and a decent amount of protein, at least a quarter of a plate of protein. If they just do those two things and those two, those only two things, they're probably going to be reducing their calorie intake without even realizing it because they're just going to be that much more full. Their energy and their blood sugar is going to be that much more stable that they're not going to feel so inclined to binge on sugary high calorie foods um they'll also feel so much better and it can be applied to pretty much any meal in fact if somebody has very very little nutritional knowledge and is right at the start beginning the first thing i get to do is just do the vegetables just say right whatever meal you're having could be pie and chips if you half of your plate is vegetables and the other half is what you use to fill up the rest of the foods that's going to be a massive improvement for some people so yeah it's just keeping it simple and that can be applied to any meal in the world you can go anywhere and um and you could be sausages it could be fish fingers it could be takeaway 
you name it, it could be anything, but if you have half a plate of vegetables and a good portion of protein, that is a massive step that's really going to help the majority of people. It is. That's really good advice. I think it comes down to the word diet. I know we're talking about diets, but diet implies weight loss. And what you're describing there is a difference between weight loss and health because you can get your calories in two completely different ways and it makes a huge difference. You talk about the energy levels there. How much better do you feel and, and you're more inclined to eat well if you've got energy. When you're low on energy, you want the Mars bar, you want the crisps and the snacks, don't you? The cake. And it's it's perpetual cycle because if you've got if you're eating really poorly and living unhealthily, you're gonna have low energy. So you're going to crave sugary, high calorie snacks for an energy pick me up. You're not gonna have the energy to exercise and it just perpetuates you know you get into this vicious cycle where you can't feel like you can get out of it whereas once you get off that train and you and you feel good however you achieve that feeling good suddenly you do want to exercise you're mentally clearer you've got more motivation you've got more physical energy and and suddenly it becomes easy because you really feel the benefits of living well and who doesn't want to feel good once you start really feeling good by doing certain things you're not going to want to stop doing them because you're going to enjoy feeling really good yeah the problem is though people a lot of people don't realize how good they can feel they um they're stuck in this way and they've been that way forever whereas you look at maybe the other end of the scale maybe us where if you have that that can of coke or you have that chocolate you get that slump and think oh, i don't want to feel like this again but people are walking around feeling like that all the time and they don't realize what good actually feels like yeah, and that is something that isn't, you can't force that on them. That's just going to have to come once they've made those changes. You can tell them till you're blue in the face how much energy they'll have and how good they'll feel, but they're not going to believe you until they genuinely feel it. So as professionals, we've just got to concentrate on making them take the action steps and the processes to getting there and get them to trust us and put faith in the process. And then once those feelings come, then they'll believe it and go, oh yeah, Mark was right, Polly was right. You know, I trusted the process and I just thought I'd go with it. And I'm sure you've got clients as I've as I've hired, we've had as I've hired, I've got we've got clients that some of them are just so reluctant and they're so hard work getting them to to get the ball rolling and they just say, Oh, but I really wanted this and oh it was a really bad day. And then you've got other ones who just said, Right, I'm gonna commit to this. I don't know if it's gonna work or not but I may as well just give it a go. And they go for it. They just do as they're told. They don't too think too much about it. They just do as they're told. And at the end of it, they go, wow, I never actually thought I could, it would really work that well. And it does. But they've got to figure that out for themselves by going through those processes. And um, I think sometimes focusing on the processes to get there and the action steps to get there is more important than the end result because the end result for some people will be so far away especially if they've got a lot of weight to lose they're eating junk and sugary snacks all day long to be super fit healthy eating a really clean diet and looking and feeling amazing is so far off they can't even see that that's too far off but we just go through and focus on the little steps it takes to get there focus on getting those vegetables in getting that protein, going for walks, you know, walking around when you're on the phone, when you're texting people, getting physically active, not sitting down at every opportunity. The end result will come naturally. So, but I do think that focusing on those, those action steps to get you there is, is the way forward. Yeah. It is. And you said about my clients, a lot of my clients are obviously over 40 and that they're, they're obese as well. And they're in such a bad place. They have been for a while that weight loss is quite difficult to begin with metabolism is slow they've got stress going on they've got relationship issues they've got kids to bring up and they're so lost that weight loss is really difficult but they focus on scale weight and they're, they're so intent on losing weight on the scales but then it's hard to begin with and the first few weeks go by maybe they're not losing the weight because again metabolism needs to kick in things like that but they'll come to me and say i'm not losing weight i'm a bit disappointed but my energy levels have gone up I'm sleeping better, my skin's clearer, all these other things. Maybe I've, I've um, dropped a trouser size, but the scale weight hasn't changed. Oh, well, isn't that amazing that you're getting the energy levels and you're sleeping better and you, f you feel great, you feel happier, feel more confident? Yeah, it is, but I want to lose the weight on scales. People are still too focused on that. and they. 
in time, they realize the benefits of the energy and the sleeping patterns and everything else. But at the start, they, they just want the numbers to come down on the scales. And that's a big challenge. Hey, this is Mark Slight from Health Buddy. I want to know if you've taken the Health Buddy Challenge yet. A short five-day program that covers every aspect of your life so that you can look, move, and feel your best. If you want to try the Health Buddy Challenge, head over now to healthbuddy.fit and take the challenge today. And it's a bit of a catch-22 because we've got to speak the language that they understand. If we say, uh, do you want to lose weight, or they say they want to lose weight, we each know what each other's means. If we were to start talking about things like body recomposition, they don't understand what that is. What we want them to do is to build muscle while burning fat and all of these other physiological changes, but they don't understand that. So we talk about weight loss as well, knowing that they'll understand what we're talking about. But on the other hand, weight is a number on the scale. And where I only coach women, we have the added problem of hormones, where throughout the month, unless they're dropping weight very, very fast, which I wouldn't even want them to do, there is going to be fluctuations. And for some women, that water retention before their period can be quite substantial. And it does look like on the scales, they've gained a lot of weight. I've had women come to me saying, I've gained eight pounds this week. And I have to try and reassure them, your body cannot turn food into eight pounds of fat in a week human bodies can't do that trust me it's only water because it's absolutely impossible for your body to do that no human bodies do that there's a number of reasons it could be water it could be hormones and it could be that natural water retention that many women get but that's premenstrual it could be some extra salty foods they've been having or carby foods if they've been eating a really really super clean diet throughout the week and then on the weekend they go out and have it doesn't have to be a lot it could be one pizza but the extra carbs and salt in that pizza and not that that's a bad thing treats are absolutely fine but the result is the extra carb load and, and salt in that and possibly sugar as well is going to bump up the water content in their body a little bit and again it is only water um, but it freaks them out no end it really really does and it demotivates them and it makes them go, oh, what's the point? I've been really, really good. And all I've done is put on eight pounds. Why should I even bother? And it's really important that we try and reassure them and make sure they don't throw in the towel, throw the, throw the baby out with the bathwater and they stay on track and they don't lose motivation because as soon as people get demotivated, they, they do, they just want to give up. They feel like they can't do it. They feel like it's not working, like they're doing everything wrong and there's no point in carrying on. And we've got to make sure they keep going, keep going just that little bit longer, one more day, one more day. And, and suddenly they go, oh, it's all gone again. I'm like, yep, you just peed it all out again, haven't you? So <laughs> it was water after all. Um, I've had exactly that, actually a client, exactly the same amount of weight as well. She rung me on a Monday uh, she checked in, said, I've lost two pounds this week. She's really happy. She rang me on the Thursday in tears because she jumped on the scales again. Um, she was eight pounds up. And I said exactly that. If you, if you go back to calories, and you know you've got to drop three and a half thousand calories a week to lose a pound. You, you've put on eight pounds. Do you realize how much food that's telling you you've actually eaten? And you haven't. You know you haven't. You know it's water. You know there's another reason behind it. It's not. You haven't put on eight pounds of fat in, in four days. It's just not possible to do that. Yeah, totally, totally. So, but we've got to keep that motivation going and then have and keep reassuring them. And that comes back to the uh, the knowledge as well and the science and, and teaching them all these things. So they don't go saying, oh, well, I had this at the weekend. I had, the reason I've put on four pounds at the weekend is because that one gin and tonic. I, no, one gin and tonic is not going to put on four pounds. You know, we have to educate and go, no, at the end of the day, it's calories that matter most. Then after that, weight could be determined by um, the amount of muscle you've got. If you've suddenly started exercising and toning up and building muscle, that might actually make you either gain weight or not lose weight by the scales. But then they'll say, oh, but actually my, my clothes are looser, but the scale says I haven't lost any weight and I want to lose weight. I'm like, hang on a minute. You're shrinking. You're clearly shrinking. But you, what would you rather be? Would you rather be smaller if your goal is to lose weight or would you rather be a number on the scale and they go oh yeah I suppose I suppose it isn't really about the actual number um like it's not about that number at all that is scales are a tool 
And if somebody is massively overweight, they the numbers on the scale are going to go down. But the lower you the lower weight you get, the closer you get to a healthy weight, the less those numbers matter because then you you may not get down to the weight that you originally thought you were going to get to, but nevertheless, you've got so much more muscle on you that you're heavier, even though you look a lot smaller. Yeah. And again, that we've got to reassure them that that it's it's not about the number on the scale. Um, and actually, I get my mums tracking the number of different wa- ways, um, as many ways as possible, so that they get a really broad spectrum of how their body's changing. Yes, we do scale weight, but also measurements with a tape measure, um, energy levels and mood, hunger, cravings. Because if they're losing weight at a steady rate, but their hunger's through the roof, they're not sleeping, they're miserable, they're craving sugar the whole time, something's got to change. I don't care they're losing weight. Something's gone wrong there and we need to start making them feel good. Because if they don't feel good, they're going to stop at some point, their willpower will run out and they will stop everything they're doing and just go right back to the start. So they need to be feeling good as well. We need to be making sure all of that is, is aligned too. That's really, really important. It's not just yeah. about the weight, it's about health too. It is, but unfortunately we're so conditioned to, to jump onto scales and things like Slimming World and Weight Watchers with your sort of public weigh-ins don't really help. But as you said, they're a tool and they work to a degree and they work for certain people. Um, BMI index is another one, um, works for certain people at certain sizes. When you get to a certain weight, they don't work. I've got quite a bit of muscle. I'm actually classed as, as overweight, quite heavily overweight on the BMI scale. It's absolute nonsense, but it will work more probably for people that are severely o- overweight, severely obese. It, it'll be a good guidance for them maybe, but once you get to a certain age range, BMI index doesn't work. Same, same as scales don't really work for me because my scale weight never changes, but my body composition can change drastically. If I took pictures, that's another, I'm sure you use that with your clients to take pictures. Yeah, well. photos um, as well. Yeah, and, and that's, that's huge. And that, that for me is, is my marker, what, what I look like, how my clothes fit rather than the scale weight. But... It's common sense though as well. Um, I see recently there's lots of initiatives to try and counter childhood obesity and they're thinking of weighing children in schools and taking them to doctors, getting weighed and what. And I'm like, that's going to be awful for them. I mean, you talked about the, the public weighing at Slimming World and Weight Watchers and how that can really be demotivating. So many women are humiliating, getting on that scale, realizing they haven't lost anything that week. And the, the look they get given by everybody else, you know, and the tuts. And it's awful. And do we really want to be inflicting that on children who are so vulnerable, who have got so many more important things to think about? And whether they're children or adults, personally, I think it's common sense whether somebody's overweight or not. You can't necessarily see their entire health internally, like you can with, say, blood tests and other health markers. But to look at, you know whether somebody is carrying too much body fat or not. You don't need to put them on the scales. I could just, you can look at people and say, yeah, you, you know, that person needs to lose a bit of fat, ideally. That person's okay. You know, you don't even need the scales to do that. But... Yeah, as you say, people are so conditioned to using scales as a marker of who they are in their entirety, let alone their health. Um, And it really, really doesn't matter nearly as much. I mean, rugby players are a classic example. You know, they are incredibly muscly bodybuilders. They're very, very heavy, even yourself. You know, you're not even big to look at. And yet by the scales, you're overweight. So these bodybuilders and and rugby players, they are morbidly obese if you put them on the scales. But they're incredibly fit and strong. And it's very, very misleading. It is. And the last thing we want to be doing is doing that to kids, I think. Um, I've loved having such a focused approach to diets. There's so much on the podcast. We talk about the, the, the other aspects of mental strength and everything else, which is really important, but this is the first time for a little while we've talked, um, so focused on diets and, and weight loss, which is really cool. We're going to come back in a couple of days. We're going to talk about it even more. Um, and we're going to fight, give, give some people some good healthy tips as well. Time saving tips in part two. So thank you so much. I'll speak to you again in a couple of days. Probably. There we go. I wasn't lying, was I? What an amazing episode that was. It's been that long since I've talked about calories myself. They actually listened to Pollyanna there. It was, was almost like going back to school for me. It was really great from my own point of view to go back and, and go through them basics again. And, and I've got to tell you, since we recorded this, I actually used a lot of them 
hints and tips that Pollyanna gave there and, and started to look at my own nutrition again because as I said at the start we, we can get lost we can um, particularly as professionals we can try and fine-tune ourselves so much but we just get a little bit lost in all the all the little micronutrients and everything else that we're trying to do um, taking it back to basics and, and calories and macronutrients every now and again is a great thing for us to do as well and definitely something I've done since speaking to Pollyanna so I can't wait to bring her back for the next episode as well because she's going to give us some great time-saving tips towards the end of the next episode, which I know is going to help me. And I know that a lot of my clients and a lot of the listeners are suffering with not having enough hours in the day. So if that's you, if you're trying to juggle the kids, the family life, the work balance, everything else, this is the one for you to listen to because you're going to get some great time-saving tips. Now, what I did say is that I'd share something from one of my friends who reached out after my last episode went live. And that is, um, as you know, the previous episode was all about my father and and the heart attacks that he had and, and, and the stresses that that put on myself and my mother at the time. And it's something that now we have to deal with. Uh, Fortunately, my father is still with us, but it's something that we have to deal with now for certainly the rest of his life. Um, He's not He's not functioning to his best abilities. His body is is broken to a degree, um, which is a which is a big shame. But obviously, we're still very grateful that he's here. But it does put a stress on on him and on us as a family as well. And one of the things that led to this was he retired a few years earlier. I think he retired when he was about fifty nine to sixty years old, which is the dream, right? Isn't that what we all want? We all want to retire early. Sod this work until we're 70, Lark. We want to finish now. We want to finish as early as possible so that we've got as much time with, if you like, a good body and a good mind to enjoy it. You don't want to retire at maybe 70, 72, 73, when maybe you might only have a few more years to live. That's how a lot of people look at it. So they want to retire as soon as possible to make the most of life. And like I said, that's what we've all wanted. That's what we all strive to do is to try and retire early. But my my good friend messaged me the other day and said, that he had a similar problem with his father and he put a lot of it down to the fact that he had retired early and didn't have any activities to keep his mind busy. And that's exactly what happened to my own father. He would retire and then he just thought, that's it, I can relax now, I don't have to do anything. He didn't have any hobbies, didn't have any pastimes, he didn't have anything to do. So he started to look at some part-time work. He'd done a, a little bit of driving here for like auto spares places, that kind of thing. And then that had to stop when he had his heart attacks. But it wasn't enough to keep him focused and busy every day. And he just, he would find that he was just milling around the house. He was just snacking regularly. And he was doing all these little things that he didn't do before, primarily because he was bored and he didn't have, he didn't have anything to fill his days with anymore. So the question was put to me, is early retirement really the sort of golden egg that it's cracked up to be? I'm, I'm now not entirely sure that it is. I'm, I think maybe... Obviously, we don't want to be working ourselves into the grave and working our, work our bone, working down to our bones. But I do think that we need to keep busy and mentally, especially, yes, physically is important, but mentally we need to stay sharp and we need to keep our minds active. So just something there for you to think about as you, as you finish with this episode and is early retirement the golden egg that it's cracked up to be? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I'll leave that with you. You have a think about that. Don't forget to come back in a couple of days where Pollyanna Hale is going to come back. She's going to share these time-saving tips, which I'm telling you now are invaluable in this modern world. So don't miss that. Thanks again for listening, guys and girls. Um, Please head over, subscribe on iTunes, subscribe on Stitcher so you don't miss an episode. Again, if you've got one of these new um, (laughs) new fangled phones, it will just flash up a notification on your phone as soon as the next episode is released. So take care. Thanks for listening. I love you all. I'll speak to you again in the next episode. They're very nutritious, and if you like them, certainly everybody would benefit from eating them, but you can't eat them unlimited. There's very few foods that you can eat unlimited. Welcome to the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. Join your host, Mark Slight, as he gets the best information, inspiration, help, and advice from the world's best athletes, performance coaches, and health experts so that you can look move and feel your best at 40 and beyond remember it's never too late to live the life of your dreams now here's your host mark slight
Hey, welcome back to episode number 36 of the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. And this is part two of my chat with a wonderful Pollyanna Hale from the Fit Mum formula. If you remember back to part one, we took it right back to basics, back to calories, macronutrients, all the simple things we can do daily to live a healthier life and to lose weight as well without becoming too stressed in this modern world with all the things we've got going on. And we're going to build on that today because Pollyanna is going to give us some amazing tips to help us live this healthy life in the busy world that we live in. So simple tips that can get a good healthy plate of food on our dinner table every night without too much stress, without too much panic. One that works for the kids, for the for the husband, for the wife, for everybody in the family is a great bit of advice for us all. So I strongly recommend you, you listen in for that one. But also stick around after the chat with Pollyanna as well. I'm going to introduce next week's guest and explain a little bit more what's coming up over the Christmas period, and explain a little bit more about what's coming up over the following month with Health Buddy. So here we go, part two with Pollyanna Howe from the Fit Mum Formula. So sit back, relax, grab a cup of tea, grab a glass of water, whatever your poison may be, relax and enjoy part two with Pollyanna Hale from the Fit Mum Formula. Hey, welcome back Pollyanna. Great to see you again. Hi. Right, we've talked a lot about diets in the first, in the first part, uh, first episode. Now, there's a lot of, we talked about health compared to diets. There's a lot of healthy foods. You you said yourself, you can get clients to eat a lot of veg. That's, that's one good way to start. But I don't want to confuse people now, especially if they're starting from scratch, but there, you can have too much of a healthy food as well, can't you? There is healthy foods out there that are really, really good for you. But from a weight loss point of view, probably not so good. You know, they're, they're high in fat, high in calories, and too many can actually do you a bit of harm on the weight loss front. Definitely. Um, this comes down to the fact that it's the hierarchy of what's important. Number one, the most important thing is calories. The next thing is macronutrients, which are proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. And then after that, it's vitamins and minerals. And what some people tend to do is head straight for the the vit the third tier, which is third most important, vitamins, minerals, micronutrients, and they're looking at they're looking at the health claims like this food is high in vitamin E, this food has loads of omega three oils, things like that, and they're missing the things like the calories and the macronutrients. So I get people coming to me. And they say, I eat really, really healthily, but I can't lose the weight. And I already know what the problem is, really, um, without them telling me. Because they're saying, I'm eating really, really nutritious stuff. And they've been following bloggers and um, and nutritionists even. And all sorts of like people online and Instagram. And they're copying their meals. And they're adding loads of healthy foods like avocados. And making nut butter energy bites. And like that and and it is super nutritious and internally they probably are very healthy for eating a lot of those foods but they're forgetting that some of these foods are very very high calorie especially the ones that are high in fat which is the highest calorie macronutrient and things like avocados nuts oils like olive oil in cooking or in dressings um all of these things are pretty high calories so yeah they can play a part in any diet they're very nutritious and if you like them certainly everybody would benefit from eating them but you can't eat them unlimited there's very few foods that you can eat unlimited the only thing i put don't put a limit on is vegetables and even then there's a caveat to if you've got ibs that's triggered by too many vegetables but that's rare um and so yeah all of these healthy foods like avocados and nut butters nuts and seeds they're very very high calorie and and if you eat too many of them they themselves the foods aren't fattening they're not going to make you fat in any way no food does that as we've already spoken about on our last podcast you can lose weight eating cake but if you eat too many of these foods and that adds up to too many calories more calories than you're burning you're going to gain weight. It's simple math and there's no way of getting around it. If you like these foods, and I said they are very nutritious, the best thing to do is just eat less of them. And because they are so calorie dense, it might be worth measuring them out just for a little while so you get used to what a normal portion is. I had one person who literally wanted to lose about half a stone, just a few pounds. She looked absolutely fine. She was very, very healthy in every way. And, but she personally, and I said, look, do you know, if you didn't lose that weight, 
you're still super healthy, you're fine. But in her mind, she just wanted to lose that little bit of a belly before a summer. I wasn't going to deny her that goal if that's what she was absolutely intent on doing. And she was eating a very nutritious diet and she does like things like oily dressings and avocados. And I said, All right, for this week, I want you to measure out your dressings using teaspoons and tablespoons, things like that just so that you can see how much you're using. So it's like when you're cooking and when you're putting dressing on your salad, you just sort of slosh it on with your hands. And you can't tell by doing that how much you're using. And it would be very, very easy while adding oil to cooking or dressing on a salad to rock up an extra three, four, even 500 calories extra than what you thought you were doing just without measuring it without knowing how much you're using so I got her to measure it out just for a week so she became more aware of what she was using and she suddenly had a light bulb she said wow I was using so much so much oil on my food um because the rest of her diet was really really good I she felt good I couldn't really fault it and just by this one change, she still was getting the benefits of those foods. She was still getting some of these healthy fats, but not enough to just to lead to just too many calories for what her personal goals were. And it was such a simple change, um, but it made all the difference. Yeah. And it's being mindful. You're not suggesting that people weigh their food forever, but just to give them an, an insight into what goes on. Now, I'm very lucky that um, I'm not training for anything particularly at the moment. So I'm just trying to maintain a, a good, healthy lifestyle. I love my nut butter. And I talked to a lady on a previous podcast and I, I think I talked to her on like a Thursday or Friday and I went, you know what? I bought a jar of peanut butter on Monday. I've just finished it. That's, that's a lot of peanut butter. I need to get a handle on this straight away. And even a teaspoon, depending on your goals, a teaspoon is great, but a teaspoon can vary from person to person a lot. So if I was training for a physique goal, for example, even a teaspoon wouldn't be right for me. I'd have to actually measure that teaspoon because four grams of peanut butter could be a teaspoon, but it could also be a teaspoon could also be 12 grams, depending on how I scoop it out the jar. Um, well, I recommend people use those baking measuring spoons. You can get them. They usually off. come. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They usually come as a little concertina thing and they yeah. usually have like a quarter teaspoon, half full, right up to like a one and a half tablespoon. And a, they are measured deliberately for baking, which has to be quite precise. Yeah. And if you fill up each of those spoons and level it off, that should be exactly whatever it is the spoon that you're using. So they can be really useful. And most people have those sitting in the bottom of their drawers anyway that they never use. So they pull those out. Now use those for, doesn't matter with things like the, the lower calorie in uh, food it is or, and proteins of those. So it does, you don't have to be so exact, especially vegetables. Don't bother weighing your vegetables, most people. But, you know, for things that are so high calorie that those few grams really do make a difference, it is worth measuring just temporarily so you get that awareness of, of how much you're using and what a normal portion is. And actually, when you see meal plans that say, for example, might say a tablespoon of, or a t even a teaspoon I've seen, a teaspoon of peanut butter on a piece of toast. Have you seen how much a teaspoon is? You couldn't spread one that's teaspoon on entire, that's not going to go over even if the soup that you spread it really really thin it's not even going to fit over a piece of toast so what um so even if that's what the meal plan says i think that's ridiculous people don't do that when you if you just do it by yourself without measuring you're probably using three tablespoons to get a good coating on a, on a piece of toast and that's a huge amount of calories for very little volume but that's what most people are doing it's not filling them up massively because it's not a huge amount of food but it is tipping them over in terms of calories yeah definitely i want to just take you back a minute you're just talking about the the difference between the fats and the carbs and stuff the calorie counting people are very concerned nowadays that about carbs and it's been like that for a little while probably since the atkins diet sort of really hit the headlines people say i'm going to go on a diet i'm going to cut out carbs but yet when you was talking about fat fat has over over half the amount of calorie over half let me get that right again let me start again has more than double the amount of calories that, that carbs has so fat when when you think you you know, i'm going to cut out carbs but i'm going to start eating avocados and nuts and seeds could actually be more detrimental to your weight loss goals than the carbs in the first place at the end of the day it comes down to calories so what i like to to do is start people off saying right everybody needs loads of vegetables and some fruit Every, pretty much everybody needs a really decent amount of protein after that you need a mixture 
of carbohydrates and fats, but the ratio of how much you have of each of those is where it gets more complicated. Some people, everybody needs their vegetables and their protein, but do you then do better off adding some new potatoes to that meal or rice? Or do you feel a lot better adding, skipping that completely and having half an avocado sliced on top of that meal? Or maybe it's half and half of each. And that's where it gets a little bit of co bit complicated about at the end of the day for weight loss or weight gain, it's calories that matter. But what foods you use to make up those calories, it gets a little bit more individual. And sometimes it's goal dependent. If you're an endurance runner and you go for lots of jogging, cycling, maybe a training for like a charity run, you're probably, not always, but probably going to be more uh, bias towards the carbohydrates rather than more fat on the other hand if you have had terrible blood sugar levels for years maybe you're creeping up towards the pre-diabetic level and you're not very active for whatever reason you might feel better having not so many carbs and getting your calories more from fat and people get again it comes down to liking certainty humans just want to be told no eat this go on the Atkins, go on the keto, cut out this, cut out carbs. It's not as simple as that. And that's where you've got to play around a little bit. Experiment, you know, maybe have a week where you have more, um, more carbs and less fat. Then have a week where you have more fat and less carbs. See how you feel. Write down, do you prefer one or the other or a mixture of both? Or are you not really bothered? And as long as you get your calories right and you're getting a bit of all your nutrients so you're not deficient in everything, then maybe it doesn't really matter and you can have what you feel like on the day. Yeah. Um, and the only reason cutting out anything could lead to weight loss is because you're cutting out calories. If you take a, um, a piece of steak with some vegetables and a jacket potato, remove that jacket potato you are going to be removing calories and that's why it will lead to weight loss. Where that doesn't sometimes work is where somebody might then eat double the amount of steak instead or add a load of butter and avocado to that meal instead of the potato. So you're just replacing those calories with a different type of food. It does make it a different meal in terms of macronutrients but in terms of calories, if it's not changed, then your your body weight, your energy balance is not going to change. Yeah. And talking about calories, you, the one word you mentioned there we've not touched on yet was fruit. Now, you're supposed to, they always say seven fruit or veg a day. How do you split that with your clients? Do you tell them that there's a limit on the fruit? I mean, my clients, I would say, if you're going to have seven fruit and veg a day, you want to be looking for me, five veg one to two fruit, five or six veg, one to two fruit that way, because there's a lot more calories in fruit than there is veg. And I don't think a lot of people understand that. I agree with you. Once people get to that stage in their health, where the smaller details matter. But when you're talking to people who are getting none, possibly one or two fruit and veg a day, and the rest of their diet is refined carbs, um, quick energy snacks, um, junk food, I would much rather they replaced a lot of that with fruit than not do it at all. Yeah. So yes, I agree further down the line, you probably want to be more biased towards vegetables than fruit, unless you're using fruit as your carbohydrate source. And maybe some people could do with more sugar. It's not bad sugar. It's natural sugar. Fruit's really healthy, but it has got more sugar in the vegetables. So unless you're needing more sugar for whatever reason, bananas are a great one. For example, if you're going for runs and endurance exercise, then um, yeah, it's probably better for most people to have more vegetables, less fruit. But as I said, when you're talking to people who are living off cheese on toast and packets of crisps, I really don't care where they get their fruit and veg from initially. I will say to them, I only want you having a maximum of one glass of juice or fruit smoothie a day or dried fruit. And ultimately, I would prefer people not to have dried fruit and juice and pure fruit smoothies. But if they're going to have them, just one a day. 
other than that if if they eat if they go from eating junk food and no fruit and veg to six apples a day i see that as progress so i think it very much depends on where a person is on their continuum and you've got to praise every little effort um along the way and and make sure that they're aware that they've done really well for adding these positive changes. And yes, they've still got a way to go. And as they move along, they're going to have to make more changes and adjust things. But initially, I think every positive change is a step in the right direction. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I was, I was a little bit further down the line than the basics there. But yeah, you're spot on. I mean, I've had people come to me who are eating crisps, bags of crisps every day. And then you try and get them to eat a bit of fruit and say, well, have some bananas instead. Yeah, but you should only have two bananas a day, shouldn't you? Well, you, you could argue yes, but have you ever seen anyone get fat on a banana? You know, it's the crisps that are doing you the damage. If you're eating three bags of crisps, why would you then say, oh, but I can only have two bananas a day? It's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bad mindset to have, but it's just what people are. People are hearing online, you know, people, oh, you should only have one apple a day. You should only have two bananas a day. That There's too much sugar in fruit, for example. But like you said, it's a natural sugar. If you're having the whole food as well, the whole fruit rather than the intrinsic sugars that you've extracted in the juices and smoothies it's going to be better for you um but people are going without the knowledge they're just hearing things online and they're, they're taking that as gospel which is where i wanted to bring you in as as a coach because you're 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 an accountability source for your clients and having you there is so valuable even if your clients know what they're doing to be able to ring you up pollyanna and say i'm having a bad day or this is happening that's happening that's invaluable having that coach there is invaluable to somebody it really, really is. And it's going back to saying that two bananas a day are too much, things like that. I, you hear the benefits of certain things like organic this and you've got to have this and that and the other. And I get people saying to me, oh, but you shouldn't, as you say, things like, I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have too many bananas in a day. But these are the same people who will go out and buy really expensive organic bars of chocolates and you know, they'll think they're buying really super nutritious, wholesome chocolate muffins. And I go, look, I would rather you ate the cheapest basics bag of carrots than organic chocolate cake. You're, you're missing the wood through the trees here. It's about priority. Sure, if you want to eat organic food, you've got the budget for that, great. But just because it's organic doesn't make it a helpful food for your goals. You know, that's a minor detail that is a bonus rather than an essential. Eating your vegetables is essential. I don't care whether they're frozen, whether they're cheap, whether they're organic, whatever. It doesn't matter as long as you're eating your vegetables. And I think people focus on these small details without seeing what's really, really important. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So you mentioned there frozen veg. Let, I'm going to put you on the spot now. You, you work with a lot of mums, but obviously creating the fit yeah. mum formula. Um, and a lot of people nowadays, not just mums, but a lot of people are busy. And one of the big excuses is we don't have time to cook. We don't have time to prep food. Can you give us, in the last few minutes of the podcast, some time-saving tips, healthy tips, that people can take away and use today? For them people that say they haven't got time to cook food, make food, what can they do to live a healthy life if they have genuinely got very little time? I think there's two approaches you can take with this. The first you can do is you can prep it in advance. So if you like proper recipe style meals, there are so many things you can put in the freezer where you spend a couple of hours on a weekend. You could knock out a bolognese, a, a casserole, you name it. I mean, so many things. You don't just have to put them into like plastic freezer bags. You can get those little silver trays where you can actually layer up proper meals as well almost like it's an entire meal that then just needs to be cooked um that's one way of doing it having all your meals already just basically to be reheated they're already done the other thing is which actually i think suits more people is just keeping it really simple you know i have people say to me oh, you know i'm literally grabbing stuff from the supermarket every day i said fine but instead of getting a macaroni and cheese ready meal Grab one of those, one of my favorite, two favorite things I love um, to recommend are those whole ready to eat cooked chickens where it's, you know, it's, you know, it's already hot. It's ready to eat. You could eat it right there and then in the supermarket. And no, it's not the freshest chicken. No, it's not organic. It's not the best quality. But at the end of the day, it's a whole chicken unprocessed. And you could do a lot worse than that with a bag of ready to eat salad. Yeah. Such a, two things. 
tasty, nutritious, quick, inexpensive. The other one is those bags of stir fry vegetables where they're already chopped. You can get so many different varieties now. You can get ones of every different type of vegetables. Um, and again, you literally tip that into a pan and the vegetables are done with your choice of protein. Frozen prawns are great. Um, if you're a vegan vegetarian, things like those corn pieces, just chuck it all in the pan, throw in some soy sauce for flavor, done. It's surprisingly tasty for a two-ingredient meal. Yeah, cooked. And they are so quick. Yeah, yeah. Baked fish. Even my children, one of their favorite meals is boiled rice with baked salmon and frozen peas. They love it. Yeah. Three ingredients. And if I've if I'm really, you know, stuck on on I haven't got around to doing the food shopping, I'll use tinned salmon. I just stir it all up. Sometimes I'll cook the rice in a stock cube to make it extra tasty. And it's so simple. You can't get much simpler than putting a salmon fillet in the oven. You don't need anything on, on it. It's tasty enough as it is. Yeah, sure, add a bit of salt and pepper, lemon, soy sauce, whatever you fancy if you want to. But if you don't, you know, it's just one thing. Add some vegetables, add a jacket potato, whatever you want. It can be really simple. We don't have to make meals that look like they come out of a, a food blogger's cookbook every single night. That's not realistic. There's nothing wrong with an omelette. In fact, omelettes are fantastic. Yep. Just yep. keep it simple. Keep it simple and use high flavored ingredients. If you like really tasty food, take advantage of really high flavored ingredients where you hardly need any of them and you just need one, maybe two. Anchovies are great. You literally one anchovy will easily do like an entire meal. They're so strongly flavored. Parmesan cheese, literally a teaspoon or two per person is so strongly flavored. Soy sauce. If you like spicy food, then hot sauces. Um, and those things are so strongly flavored that you only need to choose one and that just flavors your entire meal, an entire really, really simple meal. Yeah. Um, um, and I it mean, turns out... Really... Sorry, I'll buy chorizo and it will stay in the fridge for months. But just the tiniest little sliver in, in some cooked rice, cooked veg, it just adds so much flavor. It's, it's amazing. That's it. And the, and the yeah. flavor leaches out and it transforms the meal. And you could make a meal that was literally, uh, again, you know, rice, my kid's meal, rice, peas and salmon, three ingredients. That is it. Even choose tinned salmon if you want. For an adult, if you threw in a tiny bit of chorizo into that, that's a quite a, a delicious meal there you've got. That's four ingredients. Yeah. And it, it's just keeping it simple. People make it so much more complicated because they think that simple food is boring. But that's because they don't know how to make simple food interesting. Um, and I think, I think cooking lessons could really be invaluable to some people who these days we don't learn to cook in, in schools at all. My kids hardly ever do cooking in school, which is a real shame. They do it with me at home, so they do know how, but they don't do it at school anymore. Unless it's occasionally they're making cupcakes, very yeah. occasionally for a cake sale. Um, even when I was at school, we didn't do enough cooking, but it's something that we need. It's such an invaluable skill. As soon as you leave home, you need to be able to eat. When your parents are no longer cooking for you, how are you going to eat if you don't know how to cook? And, you know, it's something that's so important, but way above and beyond all the nonsense some of the things we learn at school today are. And yet we, we leave home not being able to feed ourselves. I just think it's ridiculous. But Nevertheless, you know, we can't change that directly. We're not going to overhaul the curriculum overnight. But that's something that people can take into their own hands. There are, we now have the internet at our disposable. So if you can't afford or don't have time to go to cookery lessons, just look for YouTube videos. There is a YouTube video for every single thing on under the sun. I can tell you without looking, there'll be a YouTube video showing you how to boil an egg and make toast. Yeah. So you can, if you want to learn how to cook, if you want to improve your cooking skills, all the resources are there for you at your disposal for free any time of day or night should you choose to use them. But people do need to take responsibility for these things. If they want to go and do these things, they have to go and do them. We as coaches can only do so much. We're not there with, with them holding their hand 24-7, making them do things. They have to take a little bit of initiative for themselves. Yeah, we can't change the school curriculum, but I like to think in our own way we are helping because we're helping adults, which is then being passed on to kids. You much so, much more so than me, being working with mums all the time. What you're educating the mums to do is then getting fed down to the kids. So in a way, you 
you're making a massive difference because you're educating the children as well because the mums are not going to go home cook the protein the veg and a little bit of couscous and then give the kid a kfc you would hope so it's going to feed down the line to them well that's often a, a really big motivator for my mums i say when we start delving into okay why do you want to eat healthy or why do you want more energy why do you want to lose weight and they say because i want to be a role model for their kids they see these statistics on childhood obesity and they see children getting unhealthier with every generation and they don't want that for their children as parents we always want the best for our kids but kids copy everything every parent will know your child at some point will come out with a swear word or come out with saying something stupid because where have they heard that they copied you and that applies to everything in life they will copy you if they see you eating a certain way they'll think that's normal in some houses it is not normal to have vegetables on the plate at a meal time and it should be you know they might reject it they you know you might not like it at first but if you make that a normal part of every meal they're not going to question it yeah. and as parents that is that is a massive thing and i'm sure with your clients being over 40 maybe some of those have still got children at home as well Absolutely. and they want the same they want their they want their kids to be healthy and the thing is once they get to teenagers they've got a bit more control over their lives and what they buy and especially when they leave home you want all of those good habits to be in place before then because by the time they've got their own money to go and all their pocket money or their allowance to go and spend on the vending machines it's too late because they've got that control themselves you've lost that control so you need to make sure all those things are in place before then and um and the best way to do it is to be a good role model yourself my children they they love exercise not because it's exercise and i never want them to see it as exercise for the sake of it but they love being active and they really enjoy healthy food they just enjoy it it's not a chore for them they're not doing it because they should it's just natural to them. And that's because they see me doing it. Yeah, that's great. And I, I, I love that. I think as a coach, there could be nothing better than seeing, seeing your client bring up their kid in, in a better way and to impact indirectly impact that child's life is, is, is a great achievement, I think. And it's, it's what brings a smile to my face, what makes me happy, keeps me doing what I'm doing. So thank you so much for that. We got through so much there. And I know people listening to that are going to just, take away so much information um, and hopefully it's dispelled some of the myths around diets as well and gives opened a few eyes as well um, give people some good information that they probably didn't know before um, and they'll take it away and everyone will be losing weight everyone will be healthy everyone will be happy as a result of listening <laughs> to that that's the idea but of course if anyone is confused about anything that we've spoken about they can always contact you mark or, or myself um, and just ask questions we're always happy to to help out to answer any questions they've got and and clarify anything that they didn't quite understand of course uh, everyone who's listening reach out in the show notes you'll be able to reach pollyanna and myself and yeah just just send us some questions we're, we're here to help so that's 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 what we do so thank you so much great. um we'll speak again soon thank great thanks for having me on as i was saying in the last episode this really should have been one of the first episodes on the 40 Fit and Fabulous podcast. It shouldn't be as late as it is. But what great advice over the last two episodes from Pollyanna. It's invaluable for all of us. No matter what you might think, we're all living a busy life, whether it's with family, whether it's with work, however it may be. We've all got a million things going on and 24 hours nowadays just does not seem enough in one day, does it? So these tips at the end of this episode were fantastic for us all. Great ways to get healthy, nutritious food on our table may not always be it may not always be the way you think it should be Pollyanna's there's talking about frozen veg and microwave rice that's stuff that i use all the time and it is a time saver it's still a good healthy choice and let's be honest it's much better than the fried foods the takeaways and the ready meals that we might be having instead so keep this one saved go back and listen to that time and again i guarantee every couple of weeks every couple of months you're going to get something new from that episode there now, coming up in the following episode is is a bit of a shift, really. Um, we're still going to be talking about health and fitness, obviously, and nutrition. Um, but we're going to be dropping the age group a little bit here because I've invited on a, a young actress by the name of Kira Bay. She's 21 years old, a young English actress. So it's a bit of a change from the, the normal guests we have on. But the reason I've invited Kira on is because there's one thing that she's doing every day, and she's doing it very well. And I believe that this is one thing that Whatever our situation, we can all learn from and we can all take a lot from Kira's example that she's setting. And 
it's a bit of a self-indulgent episode, really, because I love going to the movies. I love watching films. And I really, I got to ask Kira some, some questions that I've always wanted to know about actors and actresses and, and what's going on within the industry as well. So, yeah, we're going to cover the health and fitness. Yeah, we're going to cover the, the motivation, everything like we normally do. But there's, there's a few questions in there for me as well, just to find out what's going on. Um, about certain actors and actresses and, and what happens within the industry. I, I find it fascinating. And we talked for a long while, me and Kira, around this episode about what's going on in, in, the, in the acting world. And it is fascinating, absolutely fascinating to hear it. So I promised you at the beginning of this podcast, I'll tell you what's coming up over the next couple of months. Well, the really observant people might know is my voice is a little bit croaky today. And that is because within um, my coaching group that I'm a part of, we have decided to record a little bit of a Christmas song. Um, we're, do, we're doing it for charity. We're doing it for a homeless charity. And we thought we'd do a little bit of a mashup of a Christmas song. So today I've actually been singing a little bit, which is very unusual for me. Um, so that's why my voice is a bit croaky. So if you're listening to this podcast as it goes out live, definitely connect with me on Facebook, con- connect with me on Instagram and join me email list because in a couple of weeks time, this Christmas single is going gonna, is gonna to be released on the world via social media. And the only thing I can promise is that it's going to be a good laugh because I'll tell you one thing, I don't know why well, I can't speak about everyone else in the group, but I cannot sing one note in key. So that's definitely going to be worth watching, definitely worth listening to. Well, more watching than listening to. <laughs> Might be worth watching and turning the sound down, but it's for a great cause. So stick around and, and keep your eyes, ears and eyes peeled for that one. If you do follow me on social media, there's also a free Christmas recipe pack going about at the moment. So make sure you find that as well. Over on Facebook, you'll find the links to that. Um, We've got the Health Buddy Challenge still going as well. And coming up in January, we're going to open the doors on the Path to Happiness program, which is my signature program. It's going to last five months from February next year. Very, very limited spaces. So if that is something you're interested in, if, if in the new year you're going to want to lose weight, tone up, get fit and healthy, definitely go and check the page out for that on my website and on social media. That's the path to happiness program. Other than that, I'm just going to leave it here. I'm going to let all that information and then hints and tips from Pollyanna sink in now. Come back in the following episode in a few days time. Check out Kira Bay. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a lot different, as I said, from other episodes. It's going to be great fun. Check that out. Don't forget to subscribe and review the podcast if you love it. Um, I'll be really grateful for that. Other than that, I'll speak to you all again in a couple of days. Stay fit and healthy, guys. I love you all for listening. Take care.